whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Civilians in the crosshairs again. New images show the devastation from a Russian missile attack on a railway station in eastern Ukraine, where thousands of people were waiting to be evacuated to safety. At least 50 people dead, dozens more injured, among them children. This, the latest disregard for human life. Discipline for an onstage slap. The Motion Picture Academy has announced the punishment for this year's Best Actor winner, Will Smith, after hitting comedian Chris Rock during the award show. The decade-long ban Smith is facing and his reaction. A battle bravely fought comes to an end for a former Marine. Tonight, we remember a service member and mother we spoke with last summer about the potential toll of burn pits on the body. She lost her life to cancer this week, to the end, hoping to make a change. If my story makes a woman want to go get a mammogram, if my story um, triggers a, a little bit of conversation or a little bit of, of thinking about breast cancer in women veterans, then I'll share it all day long. Celebrating a monumental moment at the White House, Celebrating a monumental moment at the White House, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson delivers her first remarks since being confirmed as the first black woman justice to serve on the Supreme Court. Powerful words, recognizing her place in history, thankful to those who came before her, and inspiring those who will follow. It has taken 232 years and 115 prior appointments for a black woman to be selected to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. But we've made it. It's time to plan for that perfect summer getaway, but airfare is skyrocketing and deals are hard to come by. So when should you book? We went to an expert for answers as the weather warms up. There's actually still deals to be had out there. Good evening, I'm Stephanie Ramos, in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the horror in Ukraine after two Russian rockets struck a train station Ukrainians had been using to try and safely escape their country. The Kramatorsk train station in eastern Ukraine yesterday was filled with crowds of people lined up to try and board trains to leave. This is what remains tonight after the deadly horrific attack left at least 50 people, including five children dead. At least 100 more people were injured. The attack occurred as officials there say thousands of civilians were waiting to be taken to safer regions of Ukraine. This comes as Russia claims to have refocused its offensive to eastern Ukraine after what Moscow has acknowledged are significant military losses. However, a senior U.S. administration administration official tells ABC News Russian families are not being told of those deaths. The U.S. and Western allies condemned the attack on the train station. President Zelensky saying, quote, this is an evil that has no limits. James Longman leads us off tonight from Kiev. Tonight, the deadliest single attack on civilians in this war so far. A Russian missile hitting a train station in eastern Ukraine, where thousands had gathered trying to flee. At least 50 people killed, including five children, more than 100 people wounded. People here had been told to leave this eastern region and had flocked to the train station in the hopes of avoiding Russia's impending offensive. Nate Mook works for World Central Kitchen. He was there helping those trying to escape when the missile hit. The damage was spread out. Uh, from the platform all the way to the outside of the station. There were cars that had been on fire uh, that had been put out by the fire department. There were individuals that had burned alive in these cars. These were innocent women and children and grandmothers trying to evacuate on trains, and they were the target of this attack. There were families here, blood-soaked toys, a sign that children were among those trying to get away. <laughs> Absolute chaos moments after the explosion shows panicked people running for safety. 
The station in Kramatorsk is the main hub for tens of thousands of civilians who are fleeing the brutal fighting in eastern Ukraine. These photos taken just yesterday show huge crowds waiting for trains. Ukrainian officials say 4,000 people were believed to have been at the station today when the Russian missile struck, and they say Russia knew who would die in such an attack. The region's governor saying the enemy clearly knew that it is a rail station and did it to prevent people from leaving the region. Moscow denies it was behind this, but at the Pentagon... So our assessment is that... Uh, uh, that, that this was a Russian strike uh, and that they used a short-range ballistic missile to, uh, to conduct it. Ukrainian President Zelensky posted images of the aftermath saying this is an evil that has no limits. And more Russian troops are moving to fight in eastern Ukraine after a mass retreat from the areas north of Kyiv. We saw the apocalyptic aftermath of what they left behind in Borodyanka. So, I mean, take a look at this. Businesses, homes just completely destroyed all the way down this road. You can see that apartment building there. Look, People's homes just chopped in half. The fighting here and throughout Ukraine is grinding down Russian forces. The Kremlin spokesman even acknowledged as much. Yes, we have we have we have significant losses of troops, and uh, it's 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 a huge tragedy for us. Military experts estimate over 10,000 Russian soldiers have been killed as this war enters its seventh week. Russian President Putin made a rare public appearance today attending the memorial service of a Russian politician, but he said nothing about the war. And tonight, an update on journalist Benjamin Hall from Fox News. He was severely wounded and two colleagues killed when Russians opened fire on them north of Kyiv last month. He's now recovering in Texas and he posted a message saying he feels lucky to be alive and he thanked the people who helped him. He also paid tribute to his dead colleagues, 55-year-old cameraman Pierre Zakchevsky and producer Oleksandra Kushanova, 24 years old. Absolutely horrendous what's happening there on the ground. James Longman joins us tonight from Kyiv. James, we heard the Kremlin spokesman acknowledge Russian losses have been significant, but we've also learned that families in Russia aren't being given complete information about their family members who are fighting in this war. How is Russia handling this? Well, Russia is making every effort to hide the truth of this war from its own people. Just today, I saw reports on uh, Russian state TV that alleged that Ukraine is using scenes from TV shows to fake the injuries that we're seeing from places like Bucha. Of course, we have been there, we have seen it for ourselves, but this is the information that people inside Russia uh, are being given. And this includes the families of war dead. We understand that the families of soldiers who are dying here are not not even being given information. And in fact, mothers and partners of those uh, men who are dying here are going to military bases in Russia looking for answers and they're being turned away. Stephanie? Just incredible. Our thanks to you, James, for that update. We're joined now by Poland's ambassador to the UN, Krzysztof Szykurski. Ambassador, thank you for speaking with us. Poland is literally at the front lines of the war, just across the border in Ukraine. To date, you've taken in more than two and a half million refugees, and the numbers are growing by the day. What kind of strain is this putting on Poland's resources? Thank you for having me. Of course, this is a very difficult moment and situation, especially for our neighbors. Uh, and those who are fleeing Ukraine to find a shelter in the neighboring countries like Poland. But you have to know this, among these two and a half million people, most of them are children and, and women and elderly. We gave them uh, the full access to the Polish uh, uh, state system, both in the, uh, in the healthcare system and the, and the education system. We treat them as a guest. We treat them as a guest, not as a refugees. And I'm sure they are so appreciative to have a neighboring country like Poland welcoming them in. Are you concerned about a second wave of refugees as more Ukrainians flee Russia's latest offensive in eastern Ukraine? This is the new tactics of the Russian aggression. It's, uh, uh, they did not succeed the military as they wished. So now they want to turn it into the bloody humanitarian catastrophe so to, uh, so to make the Ukraine surrender. And uh, and this will have even more uh, dreadful impact on the situation of the civilians. And we know that uh, there can be new waves if this war continues like this, with this bomb bomb bombarding the, uh, the civilians and uh, bombarding and making the these atrocities as, as we uh, saw in the last days. Uh, those 7 million internally displaced uh, persons may try to find the shelter abroad. And that's uh, Poland is the first address, of course.
Yesterday, the EU ambassador to the U.S. told us he hopes most of the refugees will eventually be able to return to their homes in Ukraine. But are you prepared if a large percentage of refugees want to start a new life in Poland? You know, even before the war, we had the more than one million Ukrainians living in Poland. So some of them already found the, the, uh, the uh, place in, in Poland. So, of course, uh, that will be a different situation. So far, all the uh, our Ukrainian guests are in what uh, we can call the wait and see mood. They came to us, uh, some of them really with the just one... Uh, no, just, just, just one uh, simple belongings they, they have, no? Uh, something they can really carry on in the in the one hand. So, of course, we are prepared for that, but we need international help. No, it, it cannot be buried in the, uh, uh, just for Poland alone. No, this is this is this is impossible really to to carry on like uh, by, by one country alone with these uh, numbers and with these uh, needs. Uh, it uh, it should be the international international effort uh, to uh, resolve this humanitarian crisis that is caused by the Russian aggression. Like many around the world, we're all waiting to see what happens. And like all of Europe, this war and the sanctions on Russia are having a serious impact on your economy. What's the picture like in Poland right now? No, there are, of course, there, there is a direct impact, uh, direct impact which uh, which can be described just in the, our budgetary means that we have to uh, um, dispense on the on, on helping uh, our Ukrainian guests. If it goes to the end of this year. Uh, it will cost us uh, billions of US dollars uh, just our budget just to have uh, just to keep this uh, lim level of services for the Ukrainian guests uh, uh, alone so this is this is just internal this is just the kind of immediate effect economic effect but of course we have to count the effects of the uh, um, energy prices we have to count the effects of the food prices so economic effects would be far 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 longer with us than just this war but no, we don't really count the money now. Uh, uh, what, we, what, what we really count now is we're counting the lay, lives that we can save. This is the thing that uh, is the primary issue for today. We have to uh, save the lives. Then we will start counting money because this is, this is how we treat the situation. Let us uh, uh, do utmost to save lives. Saving lives, a priority here. Yesterday, Ambassador, as you know, the UN voted to suspend Russia from the Human Rights Council in response to the atrocities we've seen in Bucha. But some may argue that it's a fairly symbolic gesture. Should the UN call for a war crimes tribunal instead? We got an investigation that, that has been started. And, uh, and this investigation... Uh, at least as Poland said, should lead into accountability of those uh, who perpetrated the, the crimes in, uh, in, during this aggression. And hopefully that step is a step closer to ending that situation there in Ukraine. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time and, of course, your country's efforts in supporting the Ukrainians heading into your country. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Back in Washington today, President Biden celebrated the confirmation of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, who will now become the first black woman to serve on the Supreme Court. And at a White House ceremony today, Judge Jackson spoke for the first time since her confirmation, recognizing her place in history. Here's ABC's senior White House correspondent, Mary Bruce. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson stepping out of the White House today and into history. Today is indeed a wonderful day. Vice President Kamala Harris, the first black woman to hold her position, describing a letter she wrote to her own goddaughter moments after presiding over Jackson's Senate confirmation. I told her that I felt such a deep sense of pride and joy. And I will tell you, her braids are just a little longer than yours. <laughs> but as I wrote to her, I told her what I knew this would mean for her life and all that she has in terms of potential. For President Biden, a campaign promise fulfilled. This is not only a sunny day. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. This is going to let so much shine, sun shine on so many young women, so many young black women. Jackson listening, beaming, and wiping away tears. You are the very definition of what we Irish refer to as dignity. You have enormous dignity. And this communicates to people. It's contagious. And it matters. 
It matters a lot. Then it was her turn. It has taken 232 years and 115 prior appointments for a black woman to be selected to serve on the Supreme Court of the United States. But we've made it. We've made it, all of us, all of us. And, and our children are telling me that they see now more than ever that here in America, anything is possible. The judge thanking her husband, her two daughters, and her parents, both teachers, raised in the Jim Crow South. No one does this on their own. The path was cleared for me so that I might rise to this occasion. And in the poetic words of Dr. Maya Angelou, I do so now while bringing the gifts my ancestors gave. I, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. Describing this as a moment all Americans should be proud of. We have come a long way toward perfecting our union. In my family, it took just one generation to go from segregation to the Supreme Court of the United States. Just one generation to go from segregation to the Supreme Court. Such a powerful statement that really shows the impact of her confirmation. Mary Bruce joins us now. Mary, this celebration coming amid a string of positive COVID cases in Washington. And you pressed the White House on President Biden's status. What was their response? Yeah, Stephanie, the president was tested again today. He is negative. This comes as now more than 19 politicians and people close to the president have now tested positive. Much of this tied back to a big formal event here in Washington over the weekend. And the White House now acknowledges. They say, look, there is a very real possibility that the president could test positive at some point. But they say because he is boosted, because he is fully vaccinated and follows the CDC guidelines, and they do take some additional precautions here at the White House, they are relatively confident that if the president does get COVID, that he will have a mild case. But it is certainly a bit of a change in tune from the White House to admit that uh, this is possible. Stephanie. Certainly is. Mary Bruce Forrest at the White House. Thanks so much. Thank you. The awaited fallout for Will Smith. The Academy has banned the Best Actor winner from the Oscars for the next decade for slapping comedian Chris Rock on stage on live TV in front of millions of people. Smith, who already resigned from the Academy, responded to the punishment with just a few words. Here's ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman. Uh oh It took just 10 seconds for Will Smith to walk on stage. <laughs> oh, wow! But tonight, that slap and the scene afterwards earning him a 10-year ban from the Academy. A statement from the Academy of Motion Pictures Board of Governors said Smith shall not be permitted to attend any Academy events or programs, including the Academy Awards. Almost immediately afterwards, Smith putting out a statement saying, I accept and respect the Academy's decision. Last week, ahead of the board's meeting, Smith resigned from the Academy. The Academy also saluting Chris Rock with that now famous recovery. That was a uh, greatest night in the history of television. Okay. The board saying it was deeply grateful to Rock for maintaining his composure under extraordinary circumstances. But the Academy also taking itself to task for failing to adequately address the situation in the room. Just minutes after that slap, Smith returned to the stage, this time to receive his Oscar and address the crowd at the theater and the many millions watching from home. For this, we are sorry, the Academy said in a statement. This was an opportunity for us to set an example for our guests, viewers, and our Academy family around the world, and we fell short, unprepared for the unprecedented. 
Our thanks to Matt for that report. The fallout from Smith's slap was expected, but many of us weren't sure what the disciplinary action would be. For a closer look, we welcome Variety's Film Awards editor, Clayton Davis. Clayton, thank you so much for joining us. Smith is banned from the Oscars and all other Academy events for the next decade. Was this punishment expected or harsher? Yeah, uh, it is a little harsher than what we were expecting. We were expecting somewhere in the vicinity of maybe five years uh, to be banned from the Oscar ceremony. The, the, the problem was once Will Smith resigned from the Academy a week ago, that left little recourse for the Academy to take against them. They couldn't financially sanction them. They couldn't uh, do anything they would normally do to any other members. He's no longer a member. So now banning him for 10 years, does seem to be, since that was the only thing they could do, I think they went a little larger than previously uh, expected that we thought they would. So Smith stars in an upcoming $100 million drama for Apple, Emancipation, a film that has been already touted as a possible awards contender. At this point, can he be nominated for an Oscar again? He can be nominated. He can win an Oscar over the next decade. The, the, the membership only precludes him from it from going to to the Academy Awards, voting in uh, voting for nominees or potential winners, and getting access to screeners. But he's also a member of various other guilds, so he, that obviously is not important. Him resigning ensured that he wouldn't be among just the five people that have been expelled from the Academy in ninety four years. So, and that would have been a tough crowd to actually be a part of. That includes Harvey Weinstein, Roman Polanski, and Bill Cosby. So him resigning uh, freed him from that. But yes, he can still be nominated, he can still win. Emancipation is the next big project coming from Apple who won Best Picture on the same night he slapped somebody. And you mentioned those other uh, individuals who have been expelled uh, from the Academy. There has been debate surrounding the Academy's handling of Smith versus the handling of director Roman Polanski, who won Best Director in 2003, but couldn't attend the ceremony because he fled the U.S. in 1978 following a rape charge. This situation clearly different from Smith's, but the Academy eventually expelled Polanski. It took them years. But why do you think the Academy acted so so quickly in Smith's case? Well, there, there's a consistency elephant in the room that the Academy is going to have to address. And they probably think that this absolves them from any further scrutiny. But Roman Polanski, you know, you say that he was uh, a rape charge. He was convicted of underage sex with a minor, pled guilty and was awaiting sentencing and fled the U.S. and is still a fugitive till this day. If he were to come back into the U.S., assuming he wouldn't get arrested, he could go to the Academy Awards as a plus one. If Harvey Weinstein got released from jail today, he can go to the Academy Awards as someone's plus one, but Will Smith can't. And I think that's the consistency they need to start uh, building and, and get everyone on the same page. What Will Smith did was horrible, and everyone feels there needed to be some actions, but we have to make sure that that's felt across the board and everyone is open to those same types of uh, results and qualifications. Uh, so unfortunate that this had to happen. All right, Clayton Davis for us. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Prosecutors suffer a major defeat in the trial of four men accused of plotting to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. After five days of deliberations, the jury found two defendants not guilty and deadlocked on charges against the two alleged ringleaders. ABC's Alex Perez has this story. Tonight, a major legal loss for federal prosecutors who accused four men of plotting to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, kill her, and incite a civil war. Obviously, we're uh, disappointed uh, with the outcome. After five days of deliberating, a jury this afternoon failing to convict the defendants, finding Daniel Harris and Brandon Caserta not guilty and deadlocked, unable to reach a decision on charges against Adam Fox and Barry Croft. Defense attorneys arguing in court that the men were entrapped, lured in by undercover agents, but never intended on following through, calling it, quote, crazy talk. I think what the FBI did is unconscionable. 
Federal investigators who described the defendants as self-styled militiamen who were upset over Whitmer's pandemic stay-at-home order embedded informants and undercover agents in the group, building their case mostly on wiretaps, encrypted chats, and social media posts like this one from Brandon Caserta, endorsing violence against the government. I'm an anarchist. I'm about to drop a bomb. Authorities also pointing to this image of the suspects taking surveillance of Whitmer's vacation home as evidence of the plot and a alleging they plotted to blow up a nearby bridge to slow down any police response. Whitmer's office in a statement tonight saying the plot to kidnap and kill a governor may seem like an anomaly, but we must be honest about what it really is, the result of violent, divisive rhetoric that is all too common across our country. Our thanks to Alex Perez for that update. Now to new developments tonight in the Secret Service scandal. Two men appeared in court today accused of impersonating federal agents and giving expensive gifts to Secret Service agents. Prosecutors today called them dangerous flight risks. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz reports. Tonight, government attorneys say the two men charged with impersonating federal agents pose a risk to national security and should stay behind bars after admittedly lavishing gifts on Secret Service agents, including one protecting the first family. It's extremely urgent to get to the bottom of this. If this involves a, a plot to harm a protectee, you've got to stop that immediately. Prosecutors today laying out a trove of seized evidence in their case against Arianta Herzada and Haider Ali, including an arsenal of weapons and ammo, equipment for surveillance, copying hard drives and manufacturing identities, all the tools of law enforcement and covert tradecraft. The suspects are accused of compromising at least four Secret Service agents who have since been suspended. Secret Service agents are in a lot of sensitive places with super important people that are doing classified stuff. And these guys might be able or have been able to collect some of that information. Investigators say Ariane Teherzada, seen here target shooting, wearing a Secret Service patch, has admitted to posing as an officer and giving agents free gifts. He claimed partner Hader Ali funded most of their day-to-day -day operation, but didn't know the source of the money. If there's a foreign nexus to this, uh, and again, linked to a security service, that would be deeply, deeply troubling. And Martha Raddatz joins us now. Martha, at this detention hearing today, the government argued these men need to remain behind bars, but the federal judge today really pressed U.S. attorneys on what they know about who was funding this alleged scheme. Yeah, Stephanie, the government lawyers were really grilled by the judge about the funding. The judge saying he has never seen anything quite like this. But the lawyers had to admit they don't know at this point who may have been behind this. That remains a mystery. But they said these weren't just people dressing up for Halloween. This is very serious. Stephanie? Absolutely wild. All right, Martha, thanks so much. When we come back, imagine driving down the highway and watching a plane crash onto the other side of the road. This happened in Georgia. Details coming up. And our teams are on the ground in Tel Aviv with concerns growing about more bloodshed in Israel and the region after Thursday's deadly shooting. But up next, burn pits. So many wondering if members of the armed forces are now at risk of getting cancer. Up next, one woman's heartbreaking journey, raising awareness on the issue. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know? 
need to know. To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Take a look at this unbelievable video, dash cam video showing the moment a small plane crashes. Look at that crashes on a, on a busy Atlanta area highway, the plane's nose hitting the ground first and then it flipped over. Miraculously, no one was hurt, not even the pilot who walked away from that accident. We have a very sad update to a story we first brought you last November. A former Marine we profiled extensively has, as part of our look at how burn pits may have impacted those who served has died. Tonight, we look back at the life of Kate Hendricks Thomas, who lost her battle to cancer this week. And we take a look at the lasting impact she leaves behind. This week, friends and family are remembering Marine Corps veteran Kate Hendricks Thomas. Her family sharing the news of her passing on Instagram, writing, she accomplished more in this life than many do in a full one. We had the chance to share her story in November of last year. You know, when I see an overly short haircut and somebody who's a little bit wound up, that feels like home. I love, I love Marines. She enlisted in the Marine Corps after graduating from college, deploying to Iraq in 2005. It gave me so much opportunities to lead, opportunities to travel the world, a sense of purpose. Kate left the service in 2008. She went back to school, got her PhD in public health, married, and had a son. But then, 10 years later, at the age of 38, she went to her doctor for an annual checkup and received devastating news. She sat us down and said, you do have breast cancer, it's stage four. They said it looked like I had been dipped in something. I had metastases throughout my skeletal system from my skull to my toes. Kate then reflected on her time at war. When I checked in at Fallujah, I originally was housed in this area where everybody was cleaning their air conditioners all of the time. We were cleaning this chunky particulate matter out of the filters. I wasn't concerned about it. Again, I was 25 and invincible. That particulate matter, she believed, might have been the product of unfiltered trash fires or burn pits used by the military to dispose of waste, chemicals, and plastics, which potentially exposed anyone nearby to clouds of toxic fumes. So before you deployed, did anyone ever warn you about these burn pits? I definitely didn't know that I would leave my deployment with exposure risks. 
According to the U.S. Census, Kate was one of 3.8 million service members who deployed post 9-11. Advocates say eight out of 10 of those veterans were exposed to these burn pits, possibly causing serious illnesses. For years, the Veterans Administration hadn't acknowledged that people faced any long-term health risks after being exposed to burn pits, which affected what type of health care or disability they could receive. I went back and forth with the Veterans Administration for three years. Um, they, they denied my claim, they denied appeals, they said, you know, we're not, we're not approving claims for burn pits right now. But the Biden administration says they're working to change that. The administration establishing a new pilot policy for U.S. veterans who have been exposed to burn pits, especially those with constrictive bronchiolitis, lung, and rare respiratory cancers. According to the White House, the Veterans Administration will now create presumptions of exposure when the evidence of an environmental exposure and the associated health risks are strong in the aggregate, but hard to prove on an individual basis. It's an issue close to President Biden's heart. It is not because my son died of glioblastoma, disease of the brain, went very, very healthy, but he lived in the plume of those burn pits for a long time. Currently, veterans have five years after they're discharged or released to make claims related to their service in Afghanistan or Iraq. And the Biden administration wants Congress to extend that timeline. Last month, the Senate passed the Dr. Kate Hendricks Thomas Act, which expands eligibility for VA mammography screenings to veterans who served in specific areas and were exposed to toxic substances. If my story makes a woman want to go get a mammogram, if my story um, triggers a, a little bit of conversation or a little bit of, of thinking about breast cancer in women veterans, then I'll share it all day long. If anything that I have to say helps move the ball forward um, and takes care of the young women that are signing up to, to join the Marine Corps after us, if anything I can say can help them, I'm willing to say it. Kate spoke up, and her story is already making a difference. We wish Kate's family, especially her little boy, all the best. Still ahead here on Prime, the kidnapped boy who was tracked down by police using a phone. We'll explain. And airfare prices remain high, but there are still some deals out there. We speak to the experts at The Points Guy about it. That's coming up. And Walmart is putting their starting pay for truckers above six figures now as they try to contend with supply chain issues. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from Pink Floyd, the iconic group announcing they are out with their first new single in a very long time, and they are doing so to help those suffering in Ukraine. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. One big-hearted American family. What they did when they saw firsthand the Ukrainian refugee crisis and so many people in need is what it means to be America strong. Taking in 21 refugees into their own home in Poland. Sharing the selfless heart of America. Now they share the love and welcome you into their amazing home. Next week only on GMA. What if you could test your blood in your own home? This machine is going to change the world. What are you afraid of? I can't do one thing wrong or I will lose my company. This isn't just my job. This is who I am. This technology is 10 years away. Your idea is impossible. Start asking questions. Someone is going to get killed. Everything you're not telling me, I'm going to figure it out. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. 
these days with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines. We're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Putin's war, the atrocities, the unthinkable. Could it get even worse? Now as Russia digs in, fears grow. What more can the world do? Sunday, breaking new reports. Plus, D.C.'s COVID storm. What does it mean for you? Sunday on ABC's This Week. Walmart is boosting pay for new truck drivers as it works to woo more drivers to jobs that have been harder to fill during the pandemic. Let's take a look by the numbers. $95,000 a year, that is the new starting pay for Walmart's in-house fleet of truckers with a range up to $110,000 a year for new drivers. That's up from about $88,000, the current average starting salary for Walmart truck drivers. The company announced a new 12-week course as well to train eligible Walmart workers to become certified truck drivers with hopes of training up to 800 new drivers this year. Walmart also added more than 4,500 drivers last year to meet high demand for deliveries to stores and warehouses and now directly employs about 12,000 truck drivers. Overall, for the industry, the median pay for heavy truck and trailer drivers was $47,000 a year in 2020. That's according to the Labor Department. The American Trucking Association trade group says there is an 80,000 driver shortage of truckers across the U.S as low pay and long, difficult hours have created high turnover in the industry, which contributed to supply chain delays. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics says the overall number of workers in trucking is actually up 0.9% from two years ago. The online publication Quartz pointing out it may be more of a shift from big truck carriers to smaller carriers with less demanding schedules. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime. The urgent manhunt for the man charged with shooting Lady Gaga's dog walker after he was released from jail due to a clerical error. And the first privately funded mission to the International Space Station has happened. How much did the people on board pay and what do they plan to do? And an update on Tiger Woods' fight to get another green jacket. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. For this dynamic duo... Cat squats? Up. Uh, you have to go lower. Passion is in everything they do. Whoa. I think you ruffled his feathers. Ruffled his feathers is right. Who's next? Heartland Docs. New season Saturday, April 23rd at 10 on Nat Geo Wild. Putin's war, the atrocities, the unthinkable. Could it get even worse? Now as Russia digs in, fears grow. What more can the world do? Sunday, breaking new reports. Plus, D.C.'s COVID storm. What does it mean for you? Sunday on ABC's This Week. There's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. It's hard to live your life on a reality show and then say, I want certain things to be private. 
Kim, Courtney, Chloe, and Chris. The new interview that'll have everyone talking. Let us talk about relationships. Oh, my Lord. What do they now want you to know? I'm trying to think of how I even answer that. Oh, my gosh. And what led to this? Don't make me cry. Uh. The Kardashians, streaming on ABC News Live. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Emergency crews responding to the scene of a devastating attack on a train station in eastern Ukraine, where Ukrainian officials say at least 50 were killed, including five children and more than 100 injured. Two rockets hitting the transportation hub. As many as 4,000 people were trying to flee, with Russian forces now zeroing in on that region. In Kharkiv, black smoke filling the sky after Russian missiles struck a bread factory. Crews clearing debris and sifting through rubble in Borodyanka. The U.S. Embassy in Kyiv reacting, saying the world will hold Putin accountable for these atrocities. The Kremlin is denying responsibility for the train station attack, but a senior U.S. defense official tells ABC a Russian-fired missile seems to have caused it. The European Union doubling down on sanctions against Russia, including banning Russian coal imports. At the Kennedy Space Center. Go Falcon, go Dragon. Sound of a morning launch to the International Space Station. The first all-private mission, a SpaceX Dragon carrying three paying passengers and a former NASA astronaut. The travelers are an American, a Canadian, and an Israeli. They run investment, real estate, and other companies, and they will arrive tomorrow. They paid only $55 million each for the rocket ride. That includes an eight-day stay in accommodations, all meals included. Don't know about drinks. Organized by Axiom Space Company, it's NASA's first foray into space tourism. The man accused of shooting Lady Gaga's dog walker has mistakenly been released from jail in California. The Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department says that they are now looking for 18-year-old James Howard Jackson. There was a paperwork snafu resulting in the Sheriff's Department releasing him. Jackson is one of three men charged with attempted murder for shooting Ryan Fisher as he walked Lady Gaga's three dogs in Hollywood last February. Now, this search has ended for a couple from Indiana. They went missing in the Nevada desert. Nye County Sheriff's Office confirming 72-year-old Ronnie and 69-year-old Beverly Barker have been found. Ronnie Barker was found deceased. His wife Beverly was airlifted to a hospital in Reno for medical treatment and was released a day later. The couple was found in the mountainous forested high desert 177 miles northwest of Las Vegas. Both were with the car they had been towing behind a motorhome before their RV got stuck in the mud. They apparently decided to try to continue on in the car before it too got stuck. This is the moment Atlanta officers surround a man accused of carjacking a vehicle with a nine-year-old boy trapped inside. Minutes earlier Monday morning, a mother desperate for help. She pulled into a parking lot but left her son inside the car with the keys and the car running. A man then jumped in and drove off. The mother realizing she could find her son by tracking his iPhone's location and sharing real-time data with officers. Check the area, South Gordon and West, West Mead. Other police in the area joining in the chase, finally getting eyes on that car. I got the car, Peoples and RDA. Officers using a pit maneuver to stop the car, spinning it off the road. Open the door! Officers take that driver into custody, but the boy had escaped out a back window. That officer scooping him up in his arms and gently reassuring him. Tiger Woods just finished the second round of the Masters. He made the cut. He'll play this weekend now, finishing the day two over par. One over par for the tournament. Still in the hunt, going for his sixth green jacket. Now to the terror attack in Tel Aviv, Israel. A Palestinian gunman fired into a busy pub, killing at least three people and injuring 15 more. After an hours-long manhunt, the suspected gunman was killed by authorities. Ariel Reshef joins us now from Tel Aviv tonight. Ariel, what is the latest on the investigation into what happened? 
Well, Stephanie, Israeli authorities are on high alert, warning that there is a real potential for further terror attacks inside Israel in the coming weeks. There is a major police presence in, T in Tel Aviv. Lots of officers deployed now to the streets. We are now learning that both the gunman in the Tel Aviv attack and the attack in Bnei Barak just outside of Tel Aviv last week were from the area of Janine in the West Bank, the northern part of the West Bank. And now this is stoking major concerns among the Israeli military establishment that there could be a security vulnerability with Palestinians able to illegally cross into Israel from the northern part of the West Bank and carry out these attacks. Stephanie? And Ariel, this shooting is just the latest in the deadliest string of terror attacks in Israel in recent years. Is there concern about even more violence with a rare convergence of Ramadan, Passover and Easter all at the same time? There absolutely is, Stephanie. This latest spate of terror attacks has claimed the lives of 14 Israelis, and tensions are running high as we see the convergence of those three major holidays. 80,000 Muslims came to pray at the Al-Aqsa Mosque today for the first Friday prayers of Ramadan. There were fears that there could be clashes at the Al-Aqsa Mosque like we saw last year around this time. Thankfully, it was relatively quiet. Hamas has praised these attacks inside of Israel. The Palestinian Authority has condemned them, but there is increasing concern that these gunmen can come inside of Israel, wreak havoc, and possibly inflame a region that's already teetering on the edge. Stephanie? Ariel Russia for us in Tel Aviv. Thank you so much for that update, and please be safe. Thank you so much. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The prime minister of Peru is being criticized for praising Hitler for his construction of roads and airports in pre-war Germany. He claimed Hitler turned Germany into the world's leading economic power in a speech meant to encourage infrastructure development across Peru. Both the German and Israeli embassies in Lima issued statements condemning his comments. And in Russia, a Nobel Peace Prize winning journalist was attacked in his train cabin. Dmitry Muratov reports an unidentified man shouted at him and threw red acetone paint, burning his eyes. You see, he took a picture of himself and the room. He tweeted that he received medical attention and his eyesight may be affected. Muratov is the editor of an independent newspaper that has been critical of the Putin government. Next, as many Americans look to book their summer travel, domestic flight costs have increased 40% since January and are expected to climb even higher. Trevor Alt reports. The cost of your summer vacation is going up. According to online booking site Hopper, domestic flights are up 40% from the beginning of the year. Demand and higher jet fuel prices together are really driving overall domestic airfare up. Round trip domestic fares are now averaging $340, up 7% from two years ago, and international trips, $810. We do expect airfare to continue to rise all the way into June. It will increase by about 10%, so about $30 more per ticket between now and the peak. With the summer travel season around the corner, experts say you may want to start tracking flights now and book by the first week of May. But remember, there are still deals to be had. Just because average flights are getting a little bit more expensive doesn't mean that this is the end of cheap flights. On the contrary, we are still living in the golden age of cheap flights. Scott and Keys from uh, Scott's Cheap White Flights White. says in the past two weeks, he's found deals like $215 round trip to Hawaii, $395 to and from Milan, or $579 round trip to Australia. Thanks, Trevor, for that. Sounds like I have to book a trip immediately. Joining us now for more on scoring the perfect deal this summer travel season, despite rising flight prices, is the Points Guy Managing Editor, Clint Henderson. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Happy to help with bookings. Yes, I am really <laughs> excited about this because we need some help. The weather is getting much nicer. We're starting to think about the summer. When is the perfect time to book that summer trip where you can find a deal? Yeah, so the perfect time was two months ago. Oh, but, <laughs> no, but there is good news. <laughs> There's actually still deals to be had out there. Okay. Um, but you should book now because prices are only going up from here. In fact, we've seen prices go up from anywhere from 7% all the way up to 40% higher in just the past couple months. So you want to start booking those trips now or travel after summer's over. <laughs>
Okay, all right. So like right before the school year, if you have kids, right before the school year starts, right? Yeah. So Trevor listed off some of the most popular places to go. What are you seeing? Which places have that better deal? So Florida has been absolutely insane, uh, as you probably know. Um, but we're seeing demand in places like uh, Montana and Wyoming and Alaska really soar during the pandemic. It's really unusual that hotel rooms in Anchorage would be sold out, but that's what we're seeing now. So people want to go where there's lots of open space, where they have access to national parks and where they think the crowds might not be. Unfortunately, the crowds have found those spots. And so if you want to book national parks or theme parks, you want to do that sooner rather than later because prices are, are really rising and things are selling out right now. Okay, so I would totally love a girl's trip or a solo trip at some point, but I also want to spend time with my kids. So what are some places that where we can go and actually get a deal as a family? So I think right now, if you're still looking to book summer trips, I think look at places like California. We see, we're seeing some flight deals, even to places like Hawaii. So you can still go to those places, but when you see a deal, you got to jump on it really fast because like I said, prices are going up and you just have to, you have to jump at it as soon as you see it. We track all this stuff very carefully at the Point Sky. So, you know, follow our site. We do have deal alerts quite often, uh, but you wanna act fast if you see a deal alert. The other thing to be careful of is if you see a really good deal for flights, check hotel prices first, because that's where we're really seeing inflation happen is in hotel pricing. Yeah, and airfares, they've been been—they've been rising. I went to, to Miami just uh, about a month ago, and it was the tickets were much higher than usual. Do you anticipate that the airfares will, will keep rising? Unfortunately, we do. Because of a combination of factors, prices for everything are going up. Food, beverages, fuel, labor costs, that's a huge part of it. You know, a lot of people can't get workers, and so uh, all those things are increasing in price, and that's leading to higher airfare. And that surge in demand. You know, people were locked up at home for two years during COVID. They're going to travel come heck or high water this summer. So the demand is just through the roof, and that's why you're seeing prices so high right now. What about car rentals? Remember there was a point where, they're, where, where they were in short supply? Mm -hmm. Is that still happening? Yeah, we called it the car rental apocalypse. Uh, it has gotten better. I do have good news to share. So like for Maui, for instance, in Hawaii or Kauai, you can now get a rental car at least. They're not totally sold out. And prices have moderated a little bit, but you're still going to pay a lot more than you did pre-pandemic. And you want to book those reservations soon because, again, with summer demand being what it is, car rentals will sell out again. And finally, with another surge in COVID, what do travelers need to keep in mind when, with flexibility when it comes to booking? So we're really big fans right now of people spending those points and miles they've been hoarding during the pandemic. So if you've got those sitting in your mileage accounts, spend those because you're guaranteed to get those miles back if something goes wrong. If you're paying cash, the airlines had been being really flexible with giving you cash refunds. That's no longer the case. So they'll give you a voucher. They won't necessarily give you cash back. So if you can use points and miles or book a fully refundable fare because that's the only way you're going to get your cash back. Okay, that's a really good tip. I have been holding on to points for so long, so I have to go ahead and use they them. They only go down in value. you got to <gasps> spend them while you got them. Okay, all right. Time to book a trip. Yes. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, points Guy Managing Editor Clint Henderson, thank you for your time. Thank you. And before we go tonight, here is the image of the day. It is opening day for the Philadelphia Phillies. Take a trip to Philly. And no one knows how to make an entrance like their mascot, the Fanatic. The Fanatic, there he is, dropped from the sky in a parachute and made a kind of a bumpy landing, getting a mouthful of some dirt there before popping back up to cheer his team to victory. Enjoy the season, guys. That is our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us.